I'm delighted you all came. I'm Eric Siegel. I'm the director of the Botanical Garden. Um, and I see many familiar faces, but I'll ask my traditional question. For how many of you is this your first time at the garden? Wow, great. Ooh, that's wonderful. Uh, I'm delighted that you're here. Uh, for, how, for how many of you is the first time since you were like eight? <laughs> I hear that a lot. You know, I used to come up as a kid. Um, so let me just tell you quickly about the UC Botanical Garden. Um, we are one of the, not only sort of a beautiful place, but 34 acres, we've been around for 125 years. Um, and we're also one of the most diverse garden collections in the world. We're actually, we have more plant packs than any other garden, other than maybe four or five gardens that are 10 times our size. So we're very densely diverse. Um, and the collections are from virtually every continent, except Antarctica and maybe Global warming continues. We'll have collections from Antarctica. But, um, in general, um, we collect from uh, Mediterranean regions around the United States that have climates around the world that have climates like ours. Um, we also have more rare and endangered species than any other botanical garden in the country, um, and more California taxa than any garden in the country. So it's um, it's a, not only is it sort of a beautiful local place, but it's a very distinguished collection that's used for research and for education. And I've been here for two years, and I hope it shows in my voice how proud I am to be here and how much I love the place. Um, and also that I hope that you will consider coming back frequently. And to assist that, I hope you'll consider joining as members. There's a membership uh, brochure right on the way out. Um, but in any case, I, I'm glad to admit that this is an introduction uh, for many of you to the garden. Um, I'm going to uh, introduce our speaker, and to do that, I'm going to start reading, so uh, forgive me. Um, Donald Abrams, uh, Dr. Donald Abrams, is the Chief of Hematology and Oncology Division at San Francisco's General Hospital and Professor of Clinical Medicine at the University of California in San Francisco. He has, he has an integrative oncology consultation practice at UCSF Osher Center for Integrative Medicine. Uh, he received an AB in Molecular Biology from Brown and graduated from Stanford school, Med Medical School. Um, he worked at Kaiser as a, in, an internal medicine uh, resident um, and became a fellow in hematology at the Cancer Research Institute of uh, University of UCSF. Um, we invited him here particularly because he was one of the original uh, investigators and clinicians to recognize and define many early AIDS-related conditions and has long been interested in clinical trials of complementary and alternative medicine interventions for HIV, AIDS, and cancer, including evaluations of medicinal marijuana, as first inspired by Rick Doblin in 1992. In 1997, he received funding from the uh, National Institute on Dr Drug Abuse to conduct clinical trials of the short-term safety of cannabinoids in HIV infections. Subsequently, he was granted funds by the University of California Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research to continue studies of the effectiveness of cannabis in a number of clinical conditions. Um, and I, I want to highlight the fact that this makes all this work in studying, actually studying cannabis and its effect on, on medical conditions makes him rather rare in this country and perhaps in the world as, um, as the ability to conduct this kind of research is constrained um, by all kinds of uh, factors. So we're particularly delighted. Um, this is the last of five talks that we're doing, the culmination of five talks. And I think it's really appropriate that we have uh, a gentleman with us who really was there at the beginning of how uh, the modern American thought about the use of cannabis uh, to treat medical conditions. So we're delighted to have Dr. Donald Abrams with us. And thank you all for braving. It seems like we were in the eye of the storm getting here, and it looks like, I don't, how old is this building? <laughs> the roof doesn't leak. All right. So what I'd like to do is give you a little bit of the history of cannabis as medicine and also in, interweave into it uh, of how I got to be involved uh, as well. So cannabis uh, probably is one of the oldest psychoactive plants. Uh, remnants from a tomb that was exhumed in uh, northern China, just south of Mongolia, uh, suggested that a shaman, a Caucasian shaman, was buried 
in this tomb with the flowers of the female plant of cannabis sativa on either side of his head in a clay pot or a basket. Uh, it was uh, moved from China along the Silk Route to the Indian subcontinent and then further west into the Arab world where it was also used as a medicine for thousands of years. It was first introduced reportedly into the West, if you will, by a British East Indies surgeon, W.B. O'Shaughnessy, who was working in India and he saw all the potential benefits of cannabis and he brought it home to the United Kingdom. Reportedly, it became Queen Victoria's favorite treatment for her menstrual cramps, but now people say that that's not true and I don't know how we're ever to ascertain that. <laughs> but in any event, uh, it ultimately also made it, oops, sorry, oh, to the uh, US as well, uh, where it was widely available, uh, produced by many of the forerunners of what we currently know as Big Pharma. Uh, however, the interest in cannabis as a medicine began to decline in the, at the beginning of the last century when we developed uh, pharmaceutical products that targeted individual uh, conditions for which <clears throat> cannabis had uh, previously shown to be a benefit. Uh, so for example, opiates, barbiturates, even aspirin, uh, chloral hydrate was a sleeping aid. Uh, all of these sort of replaced cannabis which had many, many different uh, uses. So people were starting to be interested in, if you will, targeted therapies way back then. But the real death knell to the use of cannabis was the introduction of the so-called marijuana tax act, using the Mexican name to associate the drug with nefarious south of the border goings on. And this act was introduced by Harry Anslinger, pictured here. Uh, Harry was a prohibitionist who was the first head of the Federal Narcotics Bureau. And reportedly he was a racist. And he felt that widespread use of cannabis by African American jazz musicians and Mexican migrant workers was going to lead to increased crime and mental illness in the United States. So he convinced Congress to pass this act again using the Mexican name, which sort of did an end run around the American Medical Association who knew the medicine as cannabis. And the act imposed a tax of a dollar an ounce for medical use and $100 an ounce for uh, recreational use, which in 1937 was a, a big tax. Uh, so interestingly, the AMA stood alone in opposing the act, saying that there was no evidence that cannabis was harmful and the act would impede future investigation, which certainly it did. Uh, ultimately, the act passed, and cannabis subsequently was removed from the US pharmacopoeia in 1942. So it was available on the formulary up until 76 years ago. So I always say that cannabis has been a medicine for a whole lot longer than it hasn't been a medicine. And I actually ran into Harry Anslinger's great, great niece. She's a <laughs> proponent uh, and an activist in Colorado. And she told me when she heard me say this that Harry Anslinger was no more of a racist than any white man in 1937, yeah. whatever that means. Yeah. So 1942 was also interesting because Fiorella LaGuardia, the mayor of New York had called together a commission, the LaGuardia Commission, to investigate whether or not cannabis was going to lead to increased crime and mental illness. And they concluded, no, that patients should have access and it should be available. Every 15 or so years since 1942, some other august body of the US government has done the same and reviewed cannabis as medicine and virtually comes up with the same conclusion. I was uh, honored to be one of the 16 people on the panel of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine that worked for the last six months of 2016 uh, to produce the latest uh, analysis of all the published medical literature on the health uh, effects of cannabis and cannabinoids uh, that was uh, released in January of 2017. It was really quite quite a process and you know very interesting and we'll talk uh, more about uh, some of the findings. I'm having a little trouble with my, where's my assistant? Uh, can't advance. So, oh. I'm gonna go back and advance for you. 
Substances Act, uh, cannabis was placed in so-called Schedule One. Schedule One drugs have no accepted medical use and a high potential for abuse. And you can see the company that cannabis uh, keeps uh, in Schedule One, uh, heroin, LSD. Most recently, GHB was added. <coughs> no. Oops. Yeah. So when I uh, first became interested in studying cannabis as a uh, a potential therapeutic intervention. My colleagues, I am an oncologist, and you know, <clears throat> oncologists are very evidence-based and looking for the minute pathway that they can impact in the cancer cell. They say, Donald, why in these days of nanotechnology and genomic therapies are you interested in studying a plant? And you know, it has 400 different chemical compounds, and that is true. We know that the highest concentration of the main bioactive or psychoactive compounds is in the resin ex exuded from the flowers of the female plant, uh, as the shaman uh, back in uh, northern China knew 3,000 years ago. And this main psychoactive component, as I'm sure you're all aware, is delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, or delta-9 THC. But there are now felt to be about 140 other cannabinoid compounds that are very similar to THC present in the plant, but not present, for example, in the current Delta-9 THC medications that are out there and available, including, for example, Delta-8 tetrahydrocannabinol, which was studied in, his, in Israel in children with cancer and found to be a very useful anti-nausea drug for chemotherapy uh, present in the plant, uh, but not uh, in uh, dronabinol. So, Dronabinol is delta-9 THC in sesame oil, and it was licensed and approved in 1986 for the treatment of nausea and vomiting associated with chemotherapy. In 1992, the Food and Drug Administration expanded the indication for dronabinol to include, and if you look at the advertisement very carefully, it's for the treatment of anorexia, or loss of appetite, associated with weight loss in patients with AIDS. So, I don't, looks like some of you here remember 1992. 1992 <laughs> was prior to the availability of highly active antiretroviral therapies. And AIDS patients were dying of what we used to call the wasting syndrome, where they just lost weight, they looked like they were in concentration camps, they had fever and diarrhea, and they wasted weight. Up until 1992, the federal government was providing a handful of patients, less than 10, with 300 cannabis cigarettes a month in the so-called Compassionate Use Act. These were patients who had orphan diseases, which is defined as affecting less than 180,000 people, for whom cannabis seemed to benefit. So the government was sending them every month 300 rolled cannabis cigarettes. And it became clear that uh, cannabis was useful for appetite stimulation in patients with the wasting syndrome. So the government got concerned that thousands, if not tens of thousands of AIDS patients were going to start knocking on the door saying, we have an orphan disease, send us 300 canisters of cigarettes. So Bush one closed the Compassionate Use Program in 1992 and the FDA approved or expanded the indication of already approved dronabinol to include treatment of loss of appetite, but not the weight loss. Because in the placebo-controlled study, patients getting the, the actual drug did not gain weight compared to the placebo group. They just increased their appetite. But it was just so the government could say in 1992, we can take away this program. You don't need cannabis cigarettes, here's your marijuana. And that's when I first uh, sort of became interested in this whole issue because we started to prescribe this dronabinol to patients with HIV and they'd say, you know what, you can keep it. I don't really like this. 
It takes a long time for the effect to kick in, and when it does, I really get zonked. So what the patients are really describing is the effect of oral ingestion of THC. It has a very low and variable bioavailability or entry into our bloodstream. It takes about two and a half hours to re reach a peak plasma concentration. That's a long time if you're trying to increase your appetite before breakfast. You have to get up pretty early to take your medicine. And what's more interesting and important is that when you take it by mouth, after it goes through the GI tract, it goes into the liver, and it gets broken down by the enzyme system in the liver into another more psychoactive metabolite, an 11-hydroxy-THC, more psychoactive than the Delta-9. So that's why the patients were telling us that it takes a long time, because it does, and it takes a long time to leave. For half of it to be excreted is 20 to 30 hours. And then they get more zonked because this metabolite is formed when it's taken by mouth. And this is very similar to my cancer patients. I see a lot of older women with cancer who feel that inhaling or smoking is bad, but eating is good. So they go to the dispensary and they're told, only eat a quarter of the cookie. And they eat it and nothing happens. So they eat another quarter and nothing happens. So they eat the whole cookie. And then they call me three days later after maybe visiting the emergency room with a dysphoric episode and say, I'm never going to do that again. So that's really what I first uh, got interested in, in uh, cannabis. And it was at a time when 1992 was, I think, one of the first uh, times that Dennis Perone, may he rest in peace, he just died very recently, uh, Dennis uh, opened one of the cannabis buyers clubs and was making cannabis because we had passed some resolution in the city, I forget what it was called, that was allowing Dennis uh, to do this. And he was uh, very sophisticated uh, with his packaging, not quite as sophisticated as people are now, but uh, Amigo brand and graded the cannabis as far as its potency and gave a warning, may cause drowsiness, dry mouth, mild euphoria, and short-term memory loss, do not drive or operate heavy machinery. So Dennis uh, was very persistent and was one of the people that actually got the uh, uh, 1996 uh, bill uh, on the ballot. And that was the same year that he himself uh, was an unsuccessful Republican gubernatorial candidate here uh, in California. Oops. Uh, so, just to uh, review the kinetics of smoking or inhaling THC, when you inhale it, it's rapidly absorbed into the bloodstream with a peak concentration in two and a half minutes instead of two and a half hours. And much of it then gets dissipated in the first 30 minutes. And because it's being inhaled, less of it is going into the digestive system and less of it goes through the liver, so less of the 11-hydroxy hyperpsychoactive metabolite is formed. And again, it's a hot, much higher peak concentration and it lasts for a, long, a shorter period of time than by mouth. So I instruct usually my cancer patients that if they want better control over the onset, the depth, and the duration of the effect, that they should start out by inhaling. But if they find a product that works for them and it's available in some sort of oral form, that they need to, it's, they're able to use it less if uh, they take it by mouth because uh, this does have sort of a rapid decay. So another now deceased person that was big in this movement was Mary Rathbun. Uh, I work in the AIDS clinic uh, in my youth in, uh, at uh, Zuckerberg now, it wasn't Zuckerberg then, San Francisco General Hospital. And uh, Mary Rathman was our volunteer of the year for two years in a row <laughs> in the AIDS program. Because she would wheel our patients with AIDS to radiology and drop their prescriptions off in the pharmacy. Mary had a daughter who was killed by a drunken driver, so she was very anti-alcohol, but very pro-cannabis. And she would bake brownies uh, for her kids, as she called them, and distribute them, unbeknownst to us, of course. Uh, in the clinic at the San Francisco General Hospital. So 1992 was an interesting year. Again, it's when 
uh, you know, the compassionate use program was closed and we started prescribing Grenabinol and the International AIDS Conference was in Amsterdam that year. Because uh, it couldn't be held in Boston where it was meant to be held because we had this law that prevented visitors with HIV from coming into the United States. So the conference, which was supposed to be at Harvard, was moved to Amsterdam of all places. And I was in Amsterdam glancing at CNN headline news and I saw my friend Mary being arrested in Sonoma for baking brownies. And so when I, when I came back uh, from Amsterdam, uh, Mark Jacobson, one of my colleagues uh, at San Francisco General, brought me a letter that was written by Rick Doblin, as mentioned. Rick was a graduate of the Harvard School of Government, and he now has a PhD, and he uh, established an organization called MAPS, or the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. And Rick Doblin sent a letter to the head of research at San Francisco General, which I actually wasn't, but Mark Jacobson brought me the letter because he, I ran a, a group of uh, doctors in San Francisco that were doing research in their medical practices, and he thought a letter, as Rick Doblin suggested, that looks at the medicinal benefit of cannabis in patients with AIDS wasting uh, should come from Brownie Mary's institution, as if she were our dean. But in any event, I got the letter and I said, hmm, you know, these are sort of slow times for HIV research. We only had three AIDS drugs, and I had just published an article in the New England Journal comparing the second and the third drug together in patients who had failed the first drug. So, so I said, okay, I went to college in the 60s, so I, I picked up the gauntlet and I said, okay, let's, let's do this. So <clears throat> it wasn't as easy as I thought, number one. Uh, I was naive uh, to think that I could ask the government for 5.7 kilograms of cannabis to do a study in patients with AIDS wasting syndrome and that I would get it. And during the years that I was sort of having this conversation, if you will, with the federal government, uh, other things happen, and again, the most interesting of which was the passage of Proposition uh, uh, 215, the Compassionate Use Act, now <clears throat> 21 and a half years ago uh, in California, which allows for the right to possess and cultivate marijuana for medical purposes where medical use has been deemed appropriate and recommended by a physician. And in contrast to other states where they have very limited number of medical conditions, ours are for use in the treatment of cancer, anorexia, AIDS, spasticity, glaucoma, arthritis, migraine, or any other illness for which marijuana provides relief, which is quite a big window. So, so that's what we voted on. And we definitely <laughs> were split into two different states, as we generally are. But you can see that still the majority uh, voted in favor. And interestingly, Oops, let me go back, because that's an interesting statistic. More people voted in San Francisco for marijuana than for Bill Clinton. <laughs> so, so and, and actually, uh, oh, I forget her name, the woman that run, ran for uh, governor, that uh, she, she got less votes than marijuana too, but, but she didn't win. So anyway, so, so what I did uh, with Rick Doblin's uh, push was I submitted uh, a number of different studies uh, to uh, the government asking for uh, cannabis. And what I learned was ultimately after my second refusal uh, in 1996, uh, I went to Clinton's second uh, inauguration and somebody told me, you know, instead of having this fight with Alan Leshner, who at the time was the head of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, why don't you go meet with him when you're in Washington. Because the National Institute on Drug Abuse is the only legal source of cannabis for doing research in the United States. So anybody that wants to do a clinical trial looking at cannabis has to get the cannabis from NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse. But NIDA has a congressional mandate that they can only study substances of abuse as substances of abuse. So if you want to study cannabis as a potential useful therapy, 
you have to use their cannabis, but they cannot fund it. You have to get funding somewhere else. So I wasn't really aware of that, and when I, I did go and meet with Alan Leshner, who was quite charming and lovely, and he told me just that. And he said, Donald, we are the National Institute on Drug Abuse, not for drug abuse. <laughs> so, so what happened was in 1996, when California voted in favor and my study was not even scored by the NIH, the 1996 study, that's when protease inhibitors became available as effective treatments for HIV. And what happened was the wasting syndrome disappeared. So my urge to study that as a therapeutic sort of declined because what I was going to study to treat disappeared. However, these protease inhibitors did funny tricks with the liver. And they worked on the pathway that breaks down other drugs and other recreational substances. So there was an early report of somebody on one of these AIDS drugs that died of an ecstasy overdose. So that set off little light bulbs in my head. And I went home to my pharmacology textbook and I said, aha, uh -huh. what we're gonna do is write a study to see if it's safe for patients with HIV to inhale cannabis while they're taking these antiviral drugs. And that got me a million dollars and 1,400 of the government's finest cigarettes. <laughs> so that was the beginning of my research career. Oh, but I want to tell you that when I got the cannabis from the government, then cannabis activists started saying, Abrams is trying to kill AIDS patients with inferior cannabis. <laughs> because, because Dale Geringer from California Normal and Rick uh, Doblin did a little analysis of the cannabis that was available from uh, medicinal marijuana clubs in the Bay Area and found that whereas most samples had at least 8% THC with the range between 12 and a half and 15, some greater than 20, the lowest THC concentration was from NIDA, 3.9% THC. But you know, that's what they gave me and I was happy to have it. Here it is, one of those canisters with 300 cigarettes. Why they pack them standing up like that without twisting off the ends makes no sense because the cannabis is freeze dried. And this is Pal Mal cigarette, chew, uh, cigarette paper that uh, they're rolled in. So one question that we needed to answer right away is, well, you know, how do you standardize and inhaled medicine. So we used the so-called Fulton Puff procedure. And we asked all of our patients, we do all of our studies in our inpatient unit at Zuckerberg, well then it wasn't Zuckerberg, San Francisco General. So we said, this is how we want you, you to smoke these cigarettes. Inhale for five, hold for 10, wait 45, and then repeat. And that's what we did. And the patients were observed, the blind was usually elevated. Uh, this is a nurse <laughs> in the hallway observing the patient in the room which had a fan to ventilate the smoke ex externally because even then we were very concerned about contamination of the nursing staff with the smoke from the studies that were done <laughs> both with tobacco and with cannabis. Unfortunately, the door right next to this window uh, that closed the patient's room had an elevation from the floor of about one inch. So the nurses used to roll up a blanket and put it outside the patient's door uh, so that the smoke didn't come outside the room. Sort of the opposite of college is what I would say. Oops. So, so what we found in our study what, we did a study where uh, we took uh, 62 patients, I think, and we put them in our general clinical research center for 25 days, and they couldn't have any visitors because we're studying a schedule one substance. So, and on 21 of those 25 days, they either smoked three times a day a cigarette, a cannabis uh, cigarette, or they took dronabinol three times a day, or they took dronabinol placebo. And it was very clear to me the difference between inhaling the whole plant and taking the Delta 9 THC because those patients who were randomly assigned to taking the real 
dronabinol, and they didn't know, and I didn't know who was taking real and who was on placebo dronabinol, but they spent a lot of time in bed. Whereas those that were smoking were sort of dancing and cleaning their rooms, and they were you know, much more active. So what we found basically was that we didn't change the level of the AIDS virus in the bloodstream. We didn't change the level of the AIDS drugs in the bloodstream, and we didn't impair the immune system. If anything, the immune system of the people using the cannabinoids was improved compared to the immune system of the people that were taking the placebo capsules. So we felt that, uh, oh, we did see weight gain, by the way, uh, in the patients, unlike the expanded label where uh, the dronabinol only increased appetite, we saw patients increase their weight. Well, that, they were sort of incarcerated for 25 days and they had access to food up until 11 o'clock at night when we locked their refrigerator in their bedroom. <laughs> uh, so the patients gained about uh, six uh, kilos or pounds, I forget now. Yeah, they gained a lot of weight in the, the smoking <laughs> dronabinol, uh, smoking cannabis and the dronabinol groups, not in the placebo group. But we, we saw no evidence of, uh, you know, harm uh, in patients with HIV, and that's what we reported. And by the time we finished that study, that was the end of the 90s, uh, the state of California, if you can recall back then, had a budget surplus. And Senator John Vasconcellos, may he rest in peace, uh, appropriated $3 million a year for three years to establish a Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research at the University of California. And the purpose of this center was basically to fund clinical trials that were going to look at the potential health benefits of cannabis that were going to be conducted by University of California investigators. And again, it was uh, $3 million a year for three years, and this center has stayed in, uh, act, well, it's, it hasn't been funded, but they've kept it alive, and now with recreational revenue, it's anticipated that they will be getting another one to $2 million a year from state taxes, again, to be able to fund clinical trials. <coughs> so the first clinical trial that we completed uh, with money from the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research was a study in patients who had painful nerve damage from either HIV itself or the drugs that we use to treat HIV, so-called peripheral neuropathy. We took 16 patients with HIV-related peripheral neuropathy and we put them in our clinical research center for, I think they were in for nine days. And uh, the first two days they just got used to being there and then after that they smoked a cigarette three times a day and we noticed that the cannabis decreased their neuropathic pain. So from calculating how much pain reduction they had, we could calculate the number of patients we needed to do a randomized placebo-controlled clinical trial because, as you know, that is the gold standard of evidence-based medicine. If you do a random assignment between treatment and a placebo and then look to see what happens. While I was working with colleagues from the Pain Clinical Research Center at the University of California, and they said, Donald, you know, you're studying such a controversial substance. You should probably anchor the patient's subjective comments on how their neuropathic pain is responding with an experimental pain model. So we heated an area of the patient's forearm to 40 degrees Celsius and then applied capsaicin cream. Capsaicin is the active ingredient in chili peppers and left it on for half an hour. And that creates an area of weird feeling and hypersensitivity that we can then measure out with the person looking off in another direction with a piece of foam and a brush. So it gives us a more objective anchor of what the impact of this intervention is doing uh, to pain. So basically this is what we saw. This is in the placebo controlled study. We asked patients to keep a pain diary for a week before being admitted to our clinical research center. And then we did two days to just let them equilibrate, getting used to being off their feet perhaps and doing less activity than when they're at home. And then we raised the bar high. In a pain study, if you're trying to study a drug to see if it's effective for pain relief, if, 20, if people get a 20% reduction in their pain, that's usually considered significant. 
But my colleague said, gee, Donald, you're studying such a controversial substance. Why don't we say that a responder is someone who gets a greater than 30% reduction in their pain? So what we found was that 54% of the cannabis and 24% of the placebo group sustained a greater than 30% reduction in their pain, and that was statistically significant. And then at the end of the study, we sent them home again with a diary for a week, and we asked people not to smoke cannabis, and you can see that their pain uh, returned to baseline. This is what happened in this experiment after smoking the first cigarette of the study. The placebo group reported that their pain decreased 19%. The group smoking the real cannabis cigarette reported that their pain decreased 72%. And that was statistically significant. And this is what happened to the area on the forearm that we mapped out with a piece of foam and a brush. The bottom, the top is the placebo group. So you can see that the area either increased or stayed pretty much the same, where the cannabis group, the area again was decreased about 30%, which is what we saw in the patient's uh, report on the effect of their neuropathic pain. So we concluded that smoked cannabis is an effective treatment in patients with HIV-related painful peripheral neuropathy, and it was also effective in the experimental pain model. And we calculated the number of patients that we needed to treat for one person to get a benefit, and it was 3.6, which is exactly the number needed to treat for gabapentin, which is an anti-seizure medicine which is used in patients with neuropathic pain syndrome. So even though they weren't tested head to head, uh, we felt that cannabis was as effective uh, as the standard of care. And Todd McCaria, another person who has left us, uh, who was a cannabis physician here in the East Bay, uh, had sent me uh, a number of these labels from uh, medicinal products that were available at the beginning of the 1900s. And when we published our paper, he thanked me for proving what we've known for 100 years, that <laughs> cannabis is useful in neuropathic pain, because that's one of the reasons that it was uh, available uh, back 100 years ago. There must be something I pushed along here. So. What happened there? So the next study I did, after we, after we demonstrated that cannabis was uh, effective in treating neuropathic pain, we said, you know, my colleagues are not going to believe that smoking a cigarette is a 21st century drug delivery system. So to get something that looked a bit more snappy and medicinal, <laughs> we were approached by a German uh, company, actually now with offices here in the East Bay, uh, stores in Bickle, uh, who produced this uh, so-called volcano vaporizer name because it certainly looks like <coughs> one. And basically you put cannabis in this chamber and put it on top of this heating element which also has a fan which blows up what used to just be a turkey roasting bag. <laughs> and it has a one-way valve on it so that it doesn't come out unless you apply pressure and inhale. <clears throat> and so we did a study uh, oh, vaporization uh, allows for oops, THC uh, to come off at a lower temperature than combustion. And the vapors to inhale are cooler, purer, and probably less toxic uh, than smoke. And uh, the vaporizer uh, may, uh, cannabis delivered by vaporization, may actually be more psychoactive because less of the <coughs> THC is actually combusted. So this is a very busy slide, but first let me just tell you that the, in the study we enrolled healthy 25 to 40 year old cannabis smokers. And we put them in our clinical research center and gave them $600. And each, on each of the six days they smoked or vaporized half of one of three different strength NIDA cigarettes. 1.7, 3.4, and 6.8% THC. This was the easiest study I ever enrolled. <laughs> we had to beat people away with a stick because everybody wanted six days of cannabis and six hundred dollars. Why not? With three meals. So, so this is what happened. This is the blood level of THC. 
uh, whether smoked or vaporized. And you can see that the curves are superimposable, which means that we were delivering exactly the same amount. And we asked patients how, how high they were on a scale of uh, 0 to 100. And you can see that the physiologic effects were also the same. When I was trying to get this paper published, one of the reviewers wanted to know how I quantify or how I verified the high. You know, yeah. what would be. So I put my tongue in my cheek and I responded and they published the paper. I don't remember what I said. But this, this slide is the only slide where you see a difference between the lines. Uh, this is looking at expired carbon monoxide, which is a measure of exposure to noxious gases. And the bottom line is the vaporized group, and the top line is the smoking cigarette group. So vaporization in this study seemed to be safe and delivered equal amounts of THC and produced the same physiologic effects. So all of the studies that we've done subsequently have used the volcano vaporizer. And I'll tell you, whenever I go to a meeting uh, where cannabis activists or people in the cannabis industry are present, people always come up to me and try to say, can you study our vaporizer? And they hand me a much more portable, compact device than the volcano, which is not very portable or compact. And I said, well, what does it deliver to the bloodstream? And nobody ever knows. So we can't really do that. I mean, we have to continue to use the device that we know delivers what we want and produces the effect that we want. And let me just digress for a moment here and also say that I believe that inhalation of plant material has been done for thousands of years, and I'm pretty convinced I know what the potential harm of inhaling flowers or leaves are, but I don't know about inhaling an oil. And right now, these vape pens are very popular with a little oil on the end of them. And as an oncologist, I guess I'm a little conservative and maybe a little concerned about what the long-term effects of inhaling an oil are going to be. So let me just go and talk about pain. We have this whole system in our body of cannabinoid receptors in our brain and throughout our body. And we, we have these receptors not because we're meant to smoke cannabis, but because like endorphins, our own endogenous opiates, we make our own endocannabinoids. That is, our body makes cannabinoid-like substances in response to various things, uh, which I think Michael Pollan, uh, a Berkeley resident, has really summarized it nicely in his two books, uh, The Botany of Desire and The Omnivore's Dilemma. Michael says that the reason we and all animal species down through sponges have this system of cannabinoid receptors and endocannabinoids is to help us to forget that's what he said in The Botany of Desire. And in The Omnivore's Dilemma, he's trying to shoot a deer in the woods. And he's crouched down with a rifle on his shoulder. And he said, this is painful. And he hypothesizes that the reason that we and all animal species who are dependent on praying, E-Y-I-N-G, for their substance, have this system is to help us to forget pain. So it makes sense that cannabinoids are useful in treatment of pain. And we know if you give THC by vein, it's very potent at relieving noxious stimuli. We, it appears that uh, the anti-pain effects uh, from cannabis are linked probably to the opioid system. And we also found out that cannabinoids are effective in this rat model of nerve damage pain, which is not responsive to opiates. In rats and mice, THC greatly enhances the analgesic effect of morphine, such that 1 plus 1 equals 5 and not 2. And THC also appears to increase the pain relieving effect of other opiates. So there is a possibility that you could get enhanced and persistent analgesic effects at lower opiate dosages. So this was a study that I actually got funded to do by the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research at the same time that I got funded to do the HIV neuropathy study. The study was seeing if adding cannabis 
to morphine or, or to opiates in patients with breast and prostate cancer who had bone pain from bone metastases uh, was going to work. And I could not enroll patients in that study. And the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research took the money away from me. And subsequently, I was funded to do two other cancer patient studies by the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research, and I was unable to enroll them. One of our symptom management nurses said, Donald, cancer patients don't want to spend however many days left of their life they might have incarcerated in your general clinical research center. And then I thought, well, maybe you know, cancer patients in San Francisco have access to better cannabis than I'm going to give them in this study, so maybe they don't. And then one of our uh, sociologists uh, who studies accrual onto cancer clinical trials thought, we should study this, why cancer patients don't want to participate, but then she got a job somewhere else, so we never did that. So I got funding from NIDA to do a study to see if it was safe for patients with cancer to add cannabis to their sustained release morphine or sustained release opium. Remember, NIDA will fund a study if you're looking for potential harm. So this study actually also started out only for cancer patients, and I enrolled one. And so I just opened it up, any patient with any kind of pain taking morphine, sustained release, or oxycodone twice a day is eligible. And we wanted to see, you know, if it was safe. We wanted to look at the blood levels of the opiates when we added uh, vaporized cannabis. And so, because it's just a so-called pharmacokinetic interaction study, what happens to the blood level of the opiates when the patients inhale uh, vaporized cannabis three times a day, you don't need a lot of people. So we only had 10 patients on morphine, which is the number you actually need to make a conclusion, taking it 60 milligrams twice a day, who entered with an average pain score of 35, uh, zero, between zero and 100. We had 11 patients taking 50 milligrams twice a day of oxycodone, who actually came in with a slightly higher pain score, because as you can see, even though I said I was only studying safety, I did feel as long as they had pain, I was gonna measure and see what happened. So what happened? So this is what happened to the level of the morphine in the bloodstream. This is day one, and this is day five after vaporizing cannabis three times a day. It looks like the morphine dose, the morphine blood level is a little lower, but because these bars all cross, it is lower, but it was not significantly lower. And you can see the oxycodone curves are entwined. So if there's no change or there's a slight decrease in the level of the opiate in the bloodstream, you would expect that pain would either stay the same or perhaps increase. And what we saw, patients came in with a pain score averaging 40, and after five days it was down to 29, which was a statistically significant 25% reduction in pain. And the reduction in pain was greater in the morphine group, about 33%, compared to the oxycodone group, where it was only about 20%. But again, these numbers are too small to make a definitive conclusion as to whether or not adding cannabinoid or cannabis to opiates uh, produces uh, synergistic relief of pain. But we did conclude that it was safe because we saw no harm. Uh, we measured patients' oxygen concentrations throughout the night because when people overdose from opiates, it's usually because you're turning off respiration. And so since we didn't know which way this experiment was going to go, uh, we had to measure the oxygen throughout the night to make sure that we weren't increasing blood levels and turning off their respiratory drive. So in, in, in every aspect of all the potential harm, it was very safe. And we did conclude that it appears to enhance the pain relieving effects of the opiates when we add cannabinoids. And it's not a so-called pharmacokinetic effect because if it were, then we would expect higher levels of the opiates in the bloodstream. It's a so-called pharmacodynamic effect. And again, Todd McCurry's bottle showed me that morphine and cannabis were combined 100 years ago. I personally think it's poison because of the chocolate. <laughs> That's just a bias. Yeah. 
Whenever I get a picture, it seems to slow down. I don't get it. It's a weird I'm thing gonna, going on. I'm going to hit the thing. There. So the volume that I was one of the authors of uh, in therapeutics chapter, we had, so, so this was an interesting process. We reviewed 10,000 abstracts published in the medical literature. And we have one chapter on the potential therapeutic benefits and 15 chapters on the potential harms. Mm -hmm. And why is that? Well, there isn't that much published in the literature on therapeutic benefit. I have done most of those studies. <laughs> you just heard about them in people actually looking at cannabis. For harm, the National Institute on Drug Abuse millions and millions of dollars every year for people to study the potential harms of substances of abuse. But we did conclude that in patients with chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, oral cannabinoids are effective antiemetics. Well, why did we say oral cannabinoids? Well, the two drugs, dronabinol and nabilone, are both approved in the 1986 for treatment of chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. Have there been any studies of cannabis in cancer patients? The answer is there have been three studies, and in two of them, cannabis was only made available after dronabinol, delta-9 THC, had failed. So not likely to work. And the third study was a very small study that had conclusions that were uninterpretable. So we were true to our word, and we said oral cannabinoids. In adults with chronic pain, patients who are treated with cannabis or cannabinoids are more likely to experience a clinically significant reduction in pain. And that's two of my studies that allowed cannabis uh, to be listed. In adults with multiple sclerosis related spasticity, short term use of oral cannabinoids improves patient reported spasticity uh, symptoms. And those were our strongest conclusions from review uh, of the literature. So, sorry about this. Here we go. There you go. Ah, <clears throat> so the last study I did was quite interesting. Uh, this woman came out of the blue from the University of Minnesota, Kalpana Gupta. And Kalpana has a mouse model of sickle cell disease. Sickle cell disease, as you know, is something that is associated with recurrent painful crises due to decreased blood flow to organs. And patients usually become quite acculturated to opiates. You often in high dosages. And in her uh, mouse model of sickle cell disease, these are mice that have the human sickle gene implanted into them, she finds that uh, synthetic uh, cannabinoids uh, decrease the pain. And they also decrease markers of inflammation and markers of disease progression. So she asked if I would do a so-called proof of principle trial to see if the same occurred in humans with sickle cell disease. And this was the last study that we did. I didn't really know who she was or, you know, she came out of the blue and I said, okay, sure, I can do that. Because it was basically the same opiate, it's adding cannabinoids to opioids and I already sort of had that grant written so it wasn't very difficult for me to just change it to add sickle cell as another eligibility criteria. But she said, what would you like to study? And I said, well, I'd like to study high THC, high CBD cannabidiol, which I haven't yet talked much about, and balance THC, CBD, and placebo. And she said, that's fine, but you can only study two arms, and one has to be placebo. So since in the prior study we had done uh, THC, not very high dose, but low dose, NIDA THC, I said, let's do THC with CBD. So CBD, cannabidiol, is another one of these uh, uh, cannabinoids that my friend Sanjay Gupta has catapulted to the top of the cannabinoid list by his three-part series on CNN, Weed, Weed 2, and Weed 3, where he shows young children with refractory seizure disorders stop seizing almost immediately if they get a drop of this THC produced in Colorado under their tongue. And so CBD became like a miracle drug. And what's also appealing to our 
uh, society uh, is that it's not psychoactive. So people don't get high. And so my, Clint, uh, my husband, Clint Werner, wrote the book Marijuana Gateway to Health, How Cannabis Protects Us from Cancer and Alzheimer's. Yeah, we're sort of an interesting couple. And he, he makes up words every once in a while. And he made up a word, and I forget which one he made up and which one I made up. But he said, I think, that this, our society is euphoronoic. <laughs> I said we're euphorophobic. Mm -hmm. I forget who said which one, but, but it is true. I mean, we're Judeo-Christian, puritanical, and being high is not, you know, so that is what has elevated CBD to the top of everybody's list. Mm -hmm. And everybody's using CBD, and we have absolutely zero information on what it does. Mm -hmm. To the point where I just got a little tiny bit of money to do a survey of people using CBD-enriched products at our Osher Center for Integrative Medicine Clinic and at one of the dispensaries in San Francisco, asking them, what are you using and what is it good for? Because in the published literature to date, there is nothing about CBD. But let me just tell you, any clinical trial that we want to do requires a lot of jumping through hoops. First of all, for this study, to, to start with this one, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute approved the grant, which surprised me. I didn't really think we were going to get funded. I didn't know who this woman was. She's very lovely. We're dear friends now. Uh, she's tough. So anyway, they funded it, and we got, we got money to do the study. But I have to get it approved at Zuckerberg, San Francisco General, by the uh, Clinical Research Center, as well as the dean's office before I can do it. It has to be approved by the University of California Committee on Human Research. And then because we're studying a uh, Schedule One substance in California, it has to be approved by this panel whose name I actually forced them to change. Because it used to be called the California Research Advisory Panel. And I used to call them CRAP. And so they, they changed their name. And then you have to be approved by the DEA because we're prescribing a Schedule One substance. You know, no accepted medical use, high potential for abuse. So I have to get a Schedule One license from the federal government. And then I have to have the local DEA come to the Zuckerberg San Francisco General to look at where we're storing the cannabis in our investigational pharmacies in a locked refrigerator that's alarmed to the police department for 3% THC. <laughs> and then, because I'm studying something for a potential medicinal benefit, the Food and Drug Administration has to give me an investigational new drug number. Which was interesting for CBD, because in my 21 years of doing research with cannabis, the Food and Drug Administration, I will tell you, has been the easiest to work with of all of this list. But when I told them I wanted to study this THC CBD, they sent me back a letter putting a halt on my IND. And they said, you cannot proceed because CBD is an NME. And what they mean was a novel molecular entity. And they told me it has never been studied in humans before via inhalation. So they wanted me to give them two animal pulmonary histopathology studies. That is exposed mice and monkeys to inhale THC and look what happens to their lungs. And I said, you know, I don't do that. That's not my, I'm an oncologist. What do I know about that? So I said, I'm afraid I'm going to have to embarrass you. So, so I got an investigator in Sydney and one in London who are studying vaporized uh, CBD for schizophrenia. And they sent me their letters of support that it's easy and there's no side effects that they've seen. And then I took screenshots of dispensary menus in California, in San Francisco, that are providing 10% CBD. And then I took a picture of a rolled, uh, you know, packaged uh, cannabis cigarette that was 15% CBD. And they wrote me back and they said, okay, you can proceed with your study, either send us two pulmonary histopathologies or only enroll patients who have already inhaled CBD so you're not putting them at any greater risk than they've already put themselves. But add to the consent form that CBD might cause sterility in males. 
I said, if it's an NME, how do they know that? But we did everything they told us. And, and so once you get their approval, then you ask Nida for the canvas. And there you have it. That's what you have to do. And all of those people are allowed to make changes to your protocol design. So originally, we wanted 35 patients. I'll tell you, this study is over. And it ended like in May of 17. And because the principal investigator is in Minnesota, her statistical group is in Minnesota, and they have yet to finish the analysis of the 23 patients that were admitted twice to San Francisco General for two five-day periods separated by a month. And on one of those periods, they three times a day vaporized the THC CBD, and the other five-day period, they vaporized placebo. And we monitored their pain, and we drew blood to measure markers of inflammation and markers of disease progression. And as yet, I don't have an answer. Uh, I think that what we're going to see is that pain was improved in the group doing the CBD versus plus THC, but not statistically greater. I mean, it was improved compared to placebo, but the difference is not statistically significant. And that's probably because the number is too small. But this is off the record. If there's any press here, we don't know that yet. So as an oncologist, what I see most are people wanting to talk about CBD and THC and highly concentrated preparations of those for cancer. This is the so-called Siberian Ice Princess, who is also about 2,700 years old. And she's very well preserved because she was in Siberian ice. And her tattoos are being examined very, very carefully. And I think uh, millennials are copying the patterns. But uh, <laughs> she was put uh, through an MRI and found to be a woman of about in her mid-20s who had metastatic breast cancer to bone. And around her waist, she had a pouch that included the flowers of the female plant of cannabis, sativa. So the anthropologist or archaeologist, whoever makes these pronouncements, said she was probably using cannabis to treat the symptoms associated with her cancer, or maybe even the cancer itself. Well, personally, I think that's a pretty wide leap. You know, How do we know that everybody in this tribe wasn't buried with a pouch of cannabis around their waist? Well, in any event, there does seem to be a lot of interest in cannabis and cancer patients. And when we look at symptoms that are very common to cancer patients, weight loss, weight loss, early satiety means you get full quickly when you eat, loss of appetite, pain, anxiety, depression, nausea, and vomiting, I have one medicine that I could recommend that patients take. Instead of writing prescriptions for five or six different pharmaceuticals, that all might interact with each other or the chemotherapy that I'm giving the patient. So that's good. <laughs> and even though I showed you that there are no studies of cannabis for chemotherapy-induced nausea, this is an email from a 48-year-old guy with metastatic colon cancer writing to get an extension of the medicinal cannabis letter you issued last year. Although I did not use it until my last five sessions of chemo, me getting over the stigma of its use. It did what no other drug could do, completely solve the severe nausea I had. It allowed me to play with my children, attend their sports and school functions, and just function very normally in day-to-day -day activities. I cannot thank you enough for giving me that option. I'm currently on a chemo vacation after a clean scan, and the only time I use medical marijuana now is when I have trouble sleeping. I would like to continue to use it for that purpose instead of relying on pharmaceutical options. And that's just one. I get letters all the time. <clears throat> I believe it was Melissa Etheridge who came out on TV and said she could not have tolerated her adjuvant therapy for her breast cancer without using cannabis. So I'm happy with cannabis for managing symptoms of cancer. But what about affecting cancer itself? Well, the first evidence that it might came from our own National Cancer Institute where investigators in 1975 reported that Delta-9 THC, Delta-8 THC, and CBD all inhibited Lewis lung adenocarcinoma cell growth in the test tube and in mice. Since then, 
the body of research has moved offshore to Spain and Italy. For some reason, it's not being done in this country. And there's an increasing body of evidence that really that cannabinoids may have some activity in the test tube and in animal models. And we know that cannabis is antioxidant and anti-inflammatory, and these may also contribute uh, to anti-cancer activity. Oops. Oops. So, again, my friend Manuel Guzman in uh, Complutense University in Madrid has a lab that was studying the effect of cannabinoids on metabolism. And the most highly metabolically active cells in the body are the brain. So they would add cannabinoids to cultures of brain cells. And they said, well, maybe we could do our work faster if we did brain tumor. So they grew up a, a mouse brain tumor and they added cannabinoids and everything died. So they said, oh, we must have done something wrong. So they did it again and everything died. So they said, well, maybe these are bad cannabinoids. So they went back to normal brain and everything lived. So the cannabinoid receptor is the single most densely populated receptor in the human brain, and we don't learn about it in medical school. But it's clear that if there's going to be any cancer that may have some response to cannabinoids, it might be brain tumors. In truth, though, many different cancer cell lines in the test tube respond with anti-cancer activity when cannabinoids are added. And if you take human tumors and transplant them into mice that don't have an immune system, all of those different types of cancers respond. So when we were writing our chapter on therapeutics, we veered from our charge to only include human randomized clinical trials because there are none in cancer. And the only evidence we found was one so-called systematic review or meta-analysis, which looked at 34 different test tube and animal model studies of mouse brain tumors. And in all but one, uh, cannabinoids selectively kill the tumor cell. And in addition to killing the tumor cells, cannabinoids seem to impair new blood vessel formation, which allows cancers to continue to grow, and which, was, which is what the drug Avastin or Bevacizumab does that's very widely used in cancer treatment. And cannabinoids also in the test tube appear to block an enzyme which allows cancer cells to become invasive and spread or metastasize. So it's all very encouraging, but the only human study, or the first human study, let's say, was again done by my friend Manuel Guzman who went to the Canary Islands and he looked at nine patients with recurrent glioblastoma multiforme, the most aggressive type of brain tumor. And he dripped THC into their brain tumors via a catheter. I said, Manuel, we don't treat brain tumors topically. <laughs> but he found that there was no effect on survival in those patients who got the dripped THC on their tumors compared to those who got t uh, the chemotherapy. They both got chemotherapy. But in the test tube, THC inhibited the proliferation and decreased the, the life expectancy of the, of the cells from the biopsies. And later it was demonstrated that adding CBD further enhances the inhibitory effect. So again, certainly there's some uh, potential uh, evidence here. There was one trial that was going to be done in Israel in 60 patients who had progressive cancers despite uh, initial therapy. And he, he wanted 60 patients, but he closed the study after only enrolling four because he saw no response in those four patients. And again, he couldn't find cancer patients that were interested in participating. Nabixamols is a whole plant extract that has a one-to-one -one ratio of CBD to THC that's widely available in Canada and the European Union for treatment of pain and spasticity and multiple sclerosis and other things has not yet met the criteria that the FDA wants to be approved in this country. But in, again, a small study of only 21 people with brain tumor, when they added this under the tongue spray whole plant extract with a one-to-one -one ratio uh, to uh, traditional chemotherapy, uh, the survival at one year was improved and the overall survival was longer 
in the patients using the spray compared to placebo. This has only been released as a press release yet and not yet as a clinical trial. So uh, we, we still need to see that result. It's encouraging, uh, but not to the point where anybody deserves to have a website uh, that's called Cure Your Own Cancer. <laughs> and you can even get a Cure Your Own Cancer t-shirt from this website. And for me, the most heartbreaking thing as an oncologist is it takes, in my practice at the Osher Center, my wait is six months to see a new patient. And unfortunately, <clears throat> the number of patients who I see who have waited six months to see me treating a potentially curable malignancy with cannabis oils, expecting me to say that's a good idea when they get there is really sad because I tell these people there is no evidence that this is doing anything. I think you're basically being scammed and you had a potentially treatable malignancy that maybe no longer is. So it's very difficult because you know people think that uh, I'm behind that or supportive. When I go to uh, meetings of basic scientists and rat people that are dealing with <laughs> cannabinoids in, in, in animals, they always talk about cannabis-induced euphoria. And okay, you know, it might be a side effect, but I don't consider it an adverse experience, especially in patients with cancer or a terminal illness. And again, I say, is a single treatment that increases appetite, decreases nausea and vomiting, relieves pain and improves mood and sleep a potentially useful tool? And I think it is. I ask all of my patients at the Osher Center with cancer, what brings you joy? And the number of cancer patients who tell me that gardening brings them joy is not insignificant. I feel that if you feel that a part of you has died or you are dying, the ability to bring life out of the ground is a blessing. And if people can grow their own medicine, that's very empowering. So what about safety? Nobody has ever died from an overdose of cannabis. It's estimated that one would have to smoke 800 cigarettes to die, and that would be from carbon monoxide and not from cannabinoid poisoning. On the other hand, alcohol and nicotine are much more lethal. And the reason is, uh, unlike uh, opiates, uh, we have very few cannabinoid receptors on our brainstem, uh, which manages our respiratory center. The addictive potential and minor withdrawal syndrome are felt to be less than or equal to that of caffeine. This is from the uh, New York Times, had an editorial a, a number of years ago when they were claiming that cannabis should be made uh, legal. And this is actually from the 1999 Institute of Medicine report that we just updated in 2016. They looked at the percentage of Americans who have ever tried tobacco and the percentage who became dependent on the drug. 2% of Americans have tried heroin and 23% of those uh, have become dependent. 46% have tried cannabis and 9% have become dependent. And that number is probably inflated because more people would prefer to be treated for cannabis dependency than to be incarcerated. Yeah. <laughs> so <clears throat> a question I'm often asked is, well, how do you decide how much cannabis people should take. I mean, it's a botanical. All botanicals are varied by if they're harvested in the spring or the fall, if they're grown on the sunny side of the mountain or the shady side. So those are complex issues here. Uh, it's also difficult to standardize the dose of inhaled medicine. I showed you the Fulton Puff procedure. I think we're gonna find out that with cannabis, similar to every other drug, that there's a pharmacogenomics <laughs> that our own genetics are going to dictate how we respond. And it's probably uh, the, our CD1 receptors are different. So you might smoke cannabis and always get paranoid, and you might get euphoric, and you don't have any effect. And that could be set and setting, it could be the cannabis, or it could be SNPs, as we call them, in your uh, CB1 receptor. So we uh, came up with a a model that patient-determined, self-dosing model is recommended. Uh, cannabis is relatively safe. So the motto is start low and go slow. 
So start at a low dose and increase as you can until you reach an effect that's desirable. Uh, gabapentin that I mentioned for neuropathy is an example of a prescription drug with relatively low toxicity. We give people 300 milligrams, say, here, take this three times a day. If that doesn't work, take two. If that doesn't work, take three. And cannabis, I think, is uh, even safer. <laughs> so I don't think we've come to smoke two joints and call me in the morning yet, but we are getting closer, it appears. And certainly those of us that live in San Francisco, I, I just had a 12-hour seminar for first-year medical students. Marijuana is it medicine yet? It was, we had six two-hour sessions, and I had one of my 75-year-old women uh, with cancer who's using cannabis for many uh, symptoms come, and she says, I shop at the apothecarium. It's a bit like Nordstrom's. <laughs> and it is very high-tech, uh, very elegant, and they also advertise very prominently in San Francisco uh, magazine. So, uh, you know, definitely this is a whole different era that we live in today compared to uh, a while back. This is a, a dispensary uh, showing their wares. And uh, this is the, the buds that the bud tenders are uh, telling patients. You'll notice this label, sun grown. So sun grown means that it's outdoors. Uh, much of cannabis is grown indoors. Uh, in fact, I'm a consultant to a company in Maui uh, that has to grow in Hawaii. It's mandated that all the medicinal cannabis has to be grown indoors. I think they've been growing cannabis outdoors in Hawaii successfully for probably centuries, but yeah. it's mandated. Clint, my husband, who is a bit of a deadhead, went to 480 Grateful Dead shows and, <laughs> and judges, judges for the High Times Cannabis Cup, <laughs> believes that it's important to know if you're getting indoor or outdoor. He says to me, honey, where would you prefer to get a suntan? on the beach in Maui or downtown San Francisco in a tanning box. <laughs> he says that, that fluorescent lights and all that artificial stuff makes indoor grown more jangly uh, or unpleasant and outdoor is more mellow. And he talks about an experience with my old landlady that we had where he gave her two different types and she went totally paranoid on the indoor. So they give you the name, sour pineapple, chocolate haze, Kona bomb. Unfortunately, if you get Kona bomb at one dispensary, it might be quite different from another. So that's a problem with these names. Then they tell you whether it's predominantly sativa or indica. And this is another area of controversy lately because people have always said sativa is mental and uplifting, whereas indica is physical and a down. But some of the ethnobotanists say that's not true. I don't know. Most things that people get in the dispensaries are actually uh, hybrids, so it's all sort of, you can't tell. But I'll tell you, you don't have to press here, right? There's no, I can tell my story. So, so Clint, when he, when he uh, judged sativa for the cannabis cup, high times, they send him 57 different buds that he has to rank and, you know, in a week. <laughs> and the week that he was ranking Sativa was the week that we were hosting book, my book club at our house. <laughs> Which our house is usually like, it looks like a tornado went through it. And so I'd come home from work and he'd be down cleaning baseboards or up and <laughs> I said, Sativa, yes. <laughs> And the first person to come over to the house was my yoga buddy who walked in and said, have you been robbed? <laughs> said, I've never seen your house so clean and organized. So, so I don't think sativa, I think it is uplifting and you know, phys more physical than indica. So I, I don't tell my patients who want to sleep that they should get sativa. I think indica is, is better. And then it gives you uh, the percent, look at 10% CBD and they're telling me it's an NME. That doesn't make any sense. So it gives you the CH, and then it gives you this little wine spectator one-liner, <laughs> a bright and cerebral sativa with euphoric overtones. Yeah. You know, how could you say no to that? 
So where are we now? Uh, you know, we three, Sanjay Gupta, spent two days filming me. Two days filming me, and I was, appeared for 10 seconds. <laughs> and my appearance had me saying something that I thought we weren't even on the mic. We were walking down the hall, so-called B-roll, with the camera in front, and we're walking together, and we stopped, and he said, so? And I knew what he was asking. I said, I used to say, not in my lifetime, but I don't want to cut my lifetime short. Maybe. Because he was asking me, is it going to happen? And all bets are off now with our current administration as to what's going to happen with anything. We do know that we live in a special place, and now in California, unfortunately, these bus things with legalization have to be removed so that we can protect children. Uh, so we're not going to see buses, but we certainly have no shortage of uh, billboards <laughs> driving across the bridge there. This company, which is online cannabis uh, prescribing, and then they deliver to your house, uh, sort of like you know uh, Uber Eats or something. Uh, <laughs> And actually, you know, let me just say something about this, that as an oncologist, uh, estrogen receptor positive breast cancer is linear related to the number of alcoholic drinks a woman has. Mm -hmm. So the risk is linear, that the more drinks you have a day, the more likely you're gonna get estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And I see a lot of women survivors now who come to me and say, I've finished all that treatment and now I'm back to work and my colleagues want to go out for a drink, and I would prefer to be socially lubricated but not use alcohol. Can you give me a letter? Or my husband's coming home from work and he wants to join me in a cocktail, and I prefer not to use alcohol. Can you give me a cannabis recommendation? And I do, because in my opinion, cannabis is much healthier than alcohol, and alcohol is so mainstream. Uh, you know, I don't drink that much anymore because I don't metabolize it well, and People in restaurants look at me like, what's the matter with them? <laughs> Sanjay, okay, so at least marijuana, at least 12 million Americans have now tried it. Are penalties too sh severe? Should it be legalized? And the date? 1969. 1969. We've been having this conversation for a few weeks now. <laughs> Oops. So when my colleagues say to me, Donald, in these days of nanotechnology, and genomic therapies, why do you continue to insist on studying a plant? I say it's to get us back to the roots of medicine. Aww. And with that, I'll stop and thank you for your attention. <laughs>
being exposed to cannabis for fear that they're going to get this terrible lung fungal infection. First described by my friend and colleague Tony Fauci, who's the head of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, in one patient in 1974. Since that time in the medical literature, there are 20 cases. And there was one case series of HIV patients that found that smoking cannabis was, did not increase the risk of pulmonary aspergillosis. It was low white blood counts in smoking cigarettes. So, but all the hematologic malignancy treaters are very concerned about the risk of aspergillosis and it's, it's, it's overblown. Yes, sir. Uh, speaking of uh, smoking techniques, is there any information on whether um, smoking, uh, smoking in a pipe is better than smoking in cigarettes? Because I would think there are a lot of toxic substances on the paper. To yeah, that, especially if they're foul mouth paper. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I think a water pipe is, if you're going to do the plant, I think the, the buds, I think a water pipe is probably the best. I mean, Donald Tashkin is a friend and colleague at the University of California, Los Angeles, who's been funded for 40 years to study the adverse lung effects of cannabis smoke. And he can't find much. And he said, if you're using this to keep it illegal, you don't really have a leg to stand on. He did a large study of 1,350 patients with upper aerodigestive malignancies in the Los Angeles basin. Found that people who smoked small amounts of cannabis actually had a 37% decrease in the risk of lung cancer compared to people who didn't smoke anything. Again, suggesting it may have some anti-cancer, antioxidant, or anti-inflammatory effects. So speaking of anti-inflammatory, I'm wondering about anti-inflammatories for the brain, and would that be THC and not CBD for like neurodegenerative issues or autoimmune issues? Uh, again, I can't, we don't know the answer to that. Uh, Rafael Machulam, who's the father of cannabinoid chemistry, has been saying for years that anybody acutely having a stroke or a traumatic brain injury should be exposed to cannabis to decrease the amount of damage that the stroke or trauma is going to do, which is, has led, Clint in his book uh, said that, that cannabis should be available in NFL locker rooms more than Gatorade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think there is a movement now that, you know, to suggest that that might be the case. But uh, I don't know, with regards to whether it should be THD or CBD, yeah, CBD does not actually complex with the CB1 receptor. THC does. CBD may be in the plant to sort of modulate the effects of the THC. So, you know, I don't know. They, we, all these questions, you know, the, the products that are available, they're this, the ratio, what's the right ratio is the most frequent question that I get asked because people buy these one to one, two to one, eight to one, 20 to one. I took my rabbi to dinner. I said, Rabbi, all day long, I'm confronted with people. <laughs> all day long, all day long, I'm confronted with people asking me questions that have no answers. What do I do? How do I handle that? What's the function? She, she, she said, eight to one. <laughs> uh, I just want. I would like you, if you could, cl to clarify the story that you told about. Uh, the six-month waiting list and how your cancer patients are, are during that six-month time taking CBD oil. And then you have to tell them that they have an, an untreatable um, condition. Are you saying that um, there is some detrimental effect that the CBD oil, or just that we don't know and it may be doing nothing? Well, people who are choosing to treat cancer with CBD oil instead of conventional. Instead of, okay. Yeah, okay. They do it with, if they do it in conjunction with chemo, radiation, or surgery, whatever is appropriate for their cancer, I'm fine with that. But if there are, there's videos out there that pirate me from other videos and put me into their videos and he said this and I didn't say that, or I said it in a different context. And it's, it's, yeah. I think we have time for maybe uh, one more if that's okay. And then, uh, yeah. I know you mentioned that um, there's no studies on the use of oil and the safety of oil. But what I've seen, even more than that, is that uh, concentrate makers are separating, fractionating the distillates into micro components. 
And so, you know, I take this part from here and that part from there, or, you know, kind of like a weird Lego set of cannabinoids and terpenes and, and other fats, right? So it seems like there's some, and then there's so many different ways of, you know, uh, dabbing or baking and different temperatures and different mixtures. It seems like a huge experiment, really where nobody sees or knows what's going on, really. That, that's a statement. I don't know. <laughs> 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 